τελευταία διάλεξη του, του κλασικού σεμιναρίου για φέτος. Είναι ιδιαίτερη χαρά και τιμή για όλους εμάς να φιλοξενούμε τον καθηγητή Ρόμπερτ ε, Μόλμπι, το Πανεπιστήμιο του Λίτς. Θα ξεκινήσω συνήθω με λίγα λόγια για το σημερινό μας ε, ομιλητή. Ο Ρόμπερτ Μόλμπι σπούδασε στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Κέμπριτς, πτυχίο και διδακτορικό στις κλασικές σπουδές. Αφού εργάστηκε για ένα χρόνο στο Τεζάρους Λίγκο Λατίνες στο Μόναχο, εξελέγει ηλέκτρας λατινικών στο, καθηγητή, στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Σέφιλτ, πριν μεταφερθεί στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Λίτς, όπου εξελέγει καθηγητής λατινικής ιολογίας το 2000 και ομότιμος το 2010. Κατήχε θέσεις επισκέπτη ερευνητή στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Μονάχου, στο All Souls College του, της Οξφόρδης, τα κύρια ερευνητικά του ενδιαφέροντα αφορούν στη ρωμαϊκή κομμωδία και ελληνική, όπω επίση στην ιστορία τη λατινική γλώσσα. Εξέδωσε κριτικέ σε σχολιασμένε εκδόσει του Τίβουλου και του Φορμίωνα, του Τερεντίου, καθώ και ένα λεξικό αρχαίων λατινικών ετοιμολογιών. Αυτή την περίοδο ετοιμάζει τη μετάφραση και το επόμενο στο τρίτο βιβλίο του Κόρπου Τιμπουλιάνουμ και μια νέα έκδοση των αποστασμάτων του πρέμου λατινικού δράματο στην πολύ γνωστή σειρά ΛΕΒ. Απόψε θα μας, το θέμα που θα μας παρουσιάσει είναι οι πινακίδες της Βιτολάντα, επιστολές από το βορειότερο σύνορο της Ρώμης. It's a great pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Robert Mulby to our uh, last uh, uh, talk in our series uh, this year. It's the first time in Cyprus, I think. <laughs> and the most important information for Professor Mulby is, of course, that uh, is the Uh, Dr. Father of uh, Frisanthi. So we're ready to start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to come here. Um, I, oops, is that working okay? I can't claim that I've worked personally on these documents in the way of um, interpreting what the letters say um, or on the historical background, but I've looked at them from the point of view of link of the language of uh, colloquial Latin. And I'll have a little to say about that at the end. So these um, tablets that I'll be talking about um, tonight can be dated to around 100 AD. And they come from the Roman fort of Vindolanda in northern England, which was constructed on the frontier between the Roman province of Britain and the Celtic tribes to the north living in modern Scotland. And when we found these tablets, it really revolutionized our ideas about what army life was like on the Roman frontier. The tablets themselves are written in ink on very thin postcard sized sheets of wood um, and they've got a lot to teach us about how the Romans of this period set about controlling the most distant frontier in their empire. So there'll be various parts to this talk. I'll be looking at how these um, tablets were constructed, how they were preserved archaeologically and concentrate mainly on the content of the tablets and what they tell us about the historical background. Um, we'll be looking particularly at um, official military information about the strengths and movements of units, requests for leave, letters of recommendation, as well as more personal details about the birthday of the commandant's wife, celebration of religious festivals, and the ordering of food for the, um, the leader's camp. We'll also be looking at the nationality, the type of soldiers that were serving on the wall. None of them are from Rome, none of them are from Britain. They're actually from the German provinces. Um, they're not legionary troops, they're auxiliaries. And they're not involved mainly in warlike activities, but in construction of buildings, of forts. Um, so a more peaceful 
life than we perhaps uh, thought heretofore. And the other big thing that these documents can tell us is about the spread of literacy amongst officers, men, and particularly of slaves who we hadn't suspected had such great literacy in Latin. And finally, I'll be looking at um, what these tell us about relations between the Romans and the native Britons who are referred to contemptuously as the Britunculi, the little Brits. So I'll start with a word or two about the historical context. So I'll put some dates up there. Um, shortly after the governorship of Agricola in 85 AD, the Romans abandoned any attempt to hold the northern area of the province, equivalent to modern Scotland, and they consolidated their position further south along an east-west supply route later known by the Anglo-Saxons as Stanegate, Stone Road. And this runs, if perhaps we have the next, um, the next slide, it tell us the, show us the map, I think. Yes, you can just see from that map that it's, there's no political or racial reason for this. It's simply geographical, it's the shortest distance between east and west which will divide the rather troublesome tribes in the north from their relatives further south. But they all belong to the same Celtic families. Thank you. So Vindolanda, the port, the um, fort where these uh, documents were found, had a central position in the middle of the red line there on this wall. Um, as I say, there was a geographical um, decision to build it there, and to some extent it was arbitrary, and the tribes on both sides were related Celtic peoples. The first Vindolanda tablets can be dated to around 90 AD. The majority were written in the period between 92 and 102 AD. Now our only detailed literary source for this period is Tacitus's Agricola, and that ends in 85 with the departure of Agricola from uh, Britain. So the Vindolanda documents provide evidence for a period that was hitherto very poorly served by the sources. Some 20 years after the time these letters were written, the Emperor Hadrian replaced this series of wooden forts, which is the red line there, by um, stone forts and uh, a wall, Hadrian's wall, which is marked in the black etched line above the red line there. Um, and here he built uh, a wall and uh, newly built stone forts. And this became the permanent um, border between Roman Britain and the barbarian north. Now at this time the inhabitants of Vindolanda, when this new um, wall was built, abandoned their wooden fort and moved a couple of miles further north to a stone fort near the road. And it's this move from the wooden to the new stone fort which happened fairly quickly and so that some military records and private correspondence were simply left behind and not moved on to the new location. Now in warmer provinces such as Egypt, records of this kind would have been written on papyrus which is readily available in the area. In the north, however, such writing was done on very thin, as we said, postcard-sized pieces of wood 
from local trees such as birch, alder and oak and we have a picture of one of these on the next um, uh, PowerPoint. There we go. <laughs> Might be the one after that. That's it. Yeah. So there you can see the thin piece of wood. You can see it's folded in the middle. It's got writing on both sides and on the back would be the, the address to which it was sent. And you can see on either the far side a little fold so you could string together a number of tablets. Um, and you can see from the side, it's very thin, it's more like a wood shaving than a, than a piece of wood. Uh, it's easily folded and um, um, you can't really get much information on one of these, six, six lines or so on one of them. The method used, we think, um, was derived from the making of wooden veneers for furniture, which is mentioned in Pliny's Natural History. So the technique of getting very thin slices of wood was probably developed in that area. So these slices would then have been dried and treated perhaps with beeswax to allow them to take ink without blotching. The ink was made of soot, gum, arabic and water and as we said the card was completed on completion and quite often the ink from each side shows on the opposite side if it hadn't dried completely. The writing was done in a cursive script developed from earlier capitals for speed and some of the tablets we can't decipher yet because they're in a the form of shorthand and we've got no way of uh, knowing what the short end uh, is saying. So about 40 of these are in a short form. Now, uh, surprisingly, officers and wives, the educated members of the army, didn't write usually their own letters. They'd dictate them to a slave, and these slaves were much better at writing than the officers who were dictating. Their handwriting is much neater because that's their job. Their Latin is actually better. Uh, and we can tell the difference because quite often at the end of one of these notes, when he's dictated to his slave what he wants to say, he has a little personal note in his own handwriting at the end and you can see the difference between the person who's um, dictating it and the slave's writing who's um, um, taking down the dictation. For larger documents, then several of these cards could be strung together. Also, they could make, if they used oak, wood like oak, they could make slightly bigger um, documents for official records. Now, how were these preserved? Well, once uh, abandoned, they didn't rot down in the normal way but were preserved because of the special conditions that applied. They were deposited, first of all, um, in layers of bracken and straw flooring, which preserved them in anaerobic conditions. There's no oxygen there, so they're not going to break down through bacterial use. This was when the site was abandoned. Later on, builders came back to work on the site again and they deliberately sealed the old floors and pits with turf and clay so that the moist anaerobic conditions robbed any organic material of oxygen, prevented bacterial activity and pr provided the perfect conditions for preservation. So this explains why these remains are um, so far almost the only such writing tablets discovered by archaeologists in Rome's northern provinces. In fact they must have been used commonly in army camps uh, and other Roman sites but their disappearance elsewhere has given us a false impression to date of how widespread literacy was in these contexts in Roman times. In fact, in recent years, a small number of these leaf tablets have been discovered in forts elsewhere in Britain 
uh, particularly around Carlisle at the western end of the wall. The fact that many of the letters found at Vindolanda were sent from other places in Britain, such as York and London, tells us that this form of writing was common throughout the province and perhaps throughout Europe, northern Europe. These flimsy decaying small sheets may not have been recognised as writing materials in earlier digs um, and probably a number of them were destroyed accidentally. But now archaeologists know what they're looking for, it's likely that more of them will be found. Um, if we go back to the one before this, I think it's got some literary mentions of this type of... Uh, that's right. So you can see there that it was probably used quite commonly uh, elsewhere. They may have been the Pugilaria, the fist-sized notebooks that are mentioned by Marshall and Juvenal. Herodian there, 117, one mentions that the Emperor Commodus had made a list of prescribed persons taking a writing tablet of the kind that were made from lime wood um, cut into thin sheets and folded face to face by being bent. That's exactly what we've got here, except they're not of lime because lime doesn't grow very well in these northern provinces. Uh, we've got a mention of their use in Britain by Cassius Dio and they're mentioned in the legal writer Olpian. So these were known and mentioned in literature outside and inside Britain. And although lime wasn't used in Britain, we can see when we come to example 16, there's no need to look at it now, that the word used, tilia for uh, tablets generally, is the word for lime, so it, it gives the name to these tablets in Latin. The reason why these leaves aroused such surprise when they were first discovered in 1973 is that the type of wooden writing tablet we were accustomed to associate with the Romans was the stylus tablet that's made of thin sheets of pine wood recessed to hold wax and the wax was written on by a metal stylus and the other end of the stylus could be used then to erase the writing at the end of its use. And in fact, about 20% of the tablets found in Vindolanda are of this type. But the wax on these tablets hasn't been preserved. So the only writing we can see is where the pen's gone through the wax onto the wood below. It's been suggested that these wooden wax tablets were used for official records and legal documents requiring a long shelf life and they could be stored away in sets tied together by thongs, passing through the edges again. They were occasionally used for letters, as you could get more writing on them than on the leaves, but they'd be a lot more expensive to carry through the postal system. So that's what I wanted to say about the preservation of the tablets and what they looked like and how they were used. For the remainder of the talk, I want to concentrate on what information they contain about life on the northern frontier. The documents fall into two types, so slightly more than half is made up by personal letters exchanged on official or private social matters. And the rest, slightly under a half, are official documents such as reports on the strength uh, of the soldiers, the duty rosters, and daily and weekly reports. Now, the reason there are so many private letters is this collection doesn't seem to come from the official record office of the fort. That would have been either destroyed or moved on when they moved up to the wall. Um, there were copies that had been kept in the commandant's own house, so they're from the praetorium and not from the um, official record office. And that's good from our point of view because we get a lot more personal letters as we'll see um, later on. Uh, if we look at some of the uh, official documents to start with, 
Um, I think it's too forward. No. That's it. Um, that's the Latin. You want the Latin or the English? Perhaps we we'll go off. That's the, the Latin of a strength report. Looks like this is what it says in English translations. So we we'll leave the translation there for the time being. Um, it's from the period before the main uh, person that we know about, Serialis, and it's a report on the first cohort of Tungrians. This is an area in the Rhine, modern Germany, dating from the early 90s, and we're given the commander's name, Julius Vericundus. Uh, it was discovered in 1987, and it's a larger than average size document made out of a very thin sheet of oak. Oak is unusual. And the reason it's unusual is it's got a very pronounced um, grain that is, makes the writing difficult to read, even at the time it was written, let alone for us. So we had to use infrared devices to uh, decipher this one. The total strength of the unit you can see here is 752 men and six centurions. And there follows a list of those absent. So they're absent a total of 456. So more than half of the strength is absent, including five centurions. Um, so you can see, now what were these people doing that weren't where they were supposed to be? Um, 46 of them have been detached to a governor in York, Ferox. Um, we know this man, he was around in Britain in the late 80s, early 90s. Next comes a rather large number, 337, including two centurions, who were said to be at a place called Coria. This was a military centre near Vindolanda, known today as Corbridge. Now, why were there so many there, 337 out of 700? There were two types of cohort, a 500 type and a 1,000 type. And what seems to be happening here is that we're building up from the original 500 type with five centurions to the thousand strength with um, ten centurions, and that those absent in Corbridge were perhaps being trained as new recruits under, undergoing basic training to fill up the numbers of this particular cohort. Others were detached from the unit, a single centurion at London, probably on holiday. Um, eight of them are in Gaul, 11 are in York collecting pay, and 46 are in unknown locations. Um, so there are only 296 left out of the total that should be up to 1,000. Um, 15 of these are, six, uh, are sick, 6 are wounded, and 10 are suffering from an eye infection, uh, leaving a mere 265 and one centurion for active service. The high figure, 12% of people sick, uh, is interesting, and particularly of this lipitudo, kind of conjunctivitis, a reddening of infected eyes caused by poor sanitary conditions and vitamin deficiencies. So those suffering from this complaint will be out of action for some time. Many of the duties that the absent ones are involved with, such as in Corbridge or York, London and Gaul, um, are uh, regular military duties. The troops on the wall, we can see from this as well, were not legionaries, but auxiliaries from newly conquered Germany. 
Roman legionary troops were stationed further south in the more pacified areas of London and York. So on the border, we can see from this de uh, document, there was much flexibility in troop movements, many being detached from their units to serve elsewhere when a specific need arose. Now adding to this picture of fluidity, there are numerous requests for leave. So if we could look at the next one again, we can have a look at the Latin first and then um, the English. Oh no, we're all together there. Yep. Um, none of these requests for leave has survived in full, so what we can do is put a number of them together to um, reconstruct the form. So the form starts with the name of the applicant, then Rogo Domine, ne dignum habeas quides comiatum. My request, sir, that you hold me worthy to grant me leave, and then it tells you where the place is. So we've got some with London, some with Coria. It's not certain whether fixed periods of leave were granted. None of the documents, surprisingly, mentions a period of time for the absence, or whether, more likely, individual applications had to be made um, and the uh, officer in charge decided. Although formulaic, these documents are not reproduced by a single scribe. Each one, although the, the language is exactly the same, is written in different handwriting. So the soldier had to um, send his own form in and write it himself. The next um, sheet, we have a letter of recommendation showing that both office and officers and soldiers could expect to move about between units, or perhaps, if they were native Britons, to be absorbed into the Roman administrative system. So if we look at the English translation of this one, it's a familiar, it's a type of recommendation that would have been familiar to Cicero or the younger Pliny. Um, it's a letter from a certain Claudius Carus to the legate Seriales in charge of the fort in around 100 AD. And in it, Carus recommends a certain Brigionio, Brigionus to Seriales, who in turn is asked to bring him to the notice of a more powerful figure, Annius Questor, who is described as a Centurio Regionarius, a centurion in charge of a region at Lugovalium, which is modern Carlisle. So Questor must be one of the most powerful men, men in the local area, and he's the first example we have of this type of Centurio Regionarius, a man in charge of a particular area. The fact that Carlisle, at the western end of Stainegate, had one as early as 100 AD shows the attention the Romans were already given to civil administration. You can see he's referred to as brother, frater. This is just a common uh, term of affection at this time. Um, he was of equal rank then. Carus was of equal rank to Serialis to address him as frater, and domine, master, indicates that Kerialis had the status of a prefect, so they were both high status people involved in the correspondence. We've no indication of who Brigonius is, except that he must have been of fairly humble status. The name seems to be Celtic, with a Roman termination, and it's possible, but not provable, that this could be a native Briton. If so, it would show us how the locals could find their way into the ad imperial administration. In fact, we hear surprisingly little of the Britons in any of the documents. Apart from a short one on requisitioning transport vehicles from the local population, which I've not given you, 
There's a more interesting one, which is the next uh, on the PowerPoint of, um, and you've got the translation in Latin on the same one here. It's describing the fighting capabilities of the Britons. And as we said, it refers to them disparagingly as Britunculi, you wretched little Britons. Um, the beginning is missing. But it seems to say that the Britons are unprotected by armour, nudi, that they have a lot of cavalry, but that they do not use swords or throw javelins from horseback. And this is interesting because it seems to echo what Caesar said on his first visit to Britain of their fighting methods. The horses and chariots are used to transport them to the battle but the fighting is always done on foot. Now the purpose of this report is unknown, but it's been suggested that it could have been left for the newly arriving uh, governor by a predecessor or by another local officer. The contemptuous term Britunculi suggests no great sympathy or admiration for the Britons, and makes less likely a second suggestion about this document that local commanders were considering the possibility of recruiting them into local units. This is unlikely for two reasons. First of all, they don't seem very impressed. And secondly, it was not a policy to use locals in the army in their own uh, country. So if Britons were used, and we know they were used in uh, the forces, they were used in provinces other than Britain. Just as the auxiliaries on the wall that we talked about come from the Rhine provinces of Batavia and, Tungur and Tungria and wouldn't be used on the Rhine. The empire, we have to remember in this area, was still young. Local troops serving in their own area would have increased the risk of revolt. A document from a later period, around 120, on the evidence, this is the next one on the PowerPoint, suggests possibly by then local recruits were being taken into the Vindolanda garrison. As you can see from the translation there, it's an appeal for clemency for a man who appears to have been beaten by a centurion. And he claims that as a transmarinus, a man from across the seas, man brought up on the continent, as opposed to a homegrown and lowly vitunculus, he shouldn't have been physically abused in this way. Now, a report on work, what, what were the troops up to on the wall? And we've got a number of work assignment uh, rosters from around 100 AD, where Keriales was commander, as we saw, in charge of the, a cohort of Batavians. And it shows them to be involved mostly with construction work. So we need the next um, PowerPoint here. Um, yeah, I think we've got them all on one. This is new evidence that serious construction work, you've seen they're constructing a bathhouse, was not confined to legionary soldiers. The army seems also to have made their own shoes. This is the sutores, the shoemakers, and other items of clothing. Also, collecting raw materials from the local area, such as lead and clay, as well as probably wood for the furnaces, was a normal duty of the troops. The mention of a hospital backs up archaeological evidence for the existence of hospitals for sick and wounded in a medical context uh, uh, long before their appearance in civil urban context, so in, in a military context, they developed um, hospitals reasonably early. Uh, this is backed up by a tablet containing two medical prescriptions, 
and there are mentions in other tablets of medical orderlies and pharmacists and veterinarians. One of these veterinary doctors named Virilis, who would have been essential for the care of the horses attached to the unit, is mentioned in an interesting letter from one Trautius, a German, Germanic name, to a certain Veldeus, a Celtic name. Veldeus is groom to the governor in London. This is the next um, document. See Trautius, Veldeus, well, Fratri again. Um, we need the translation here. You can see their friends, regular correspondence. Presumably, Valdeus received it in London, but disposed of it when he got back to Vindolanda. The two correspondents are regular writers, as we can tell from the gentle reproach. Um, you know, I am, I'm surprised that you have written nothing back to me for such a long time. They clearly have friends and relations in common, such as the vet Virilis, and this is one where the personal address, um, second hand, it is my wish that you enjoy the best of fortune, was added in a different handwriting by the author of the letter by Cherutius himself. And this is a case again where the, um, the, the soldier's handwriting is worse than that of the scribe he was dictating to. It's interesting also this one for the mention of two ladies, Futena and Velvutena, probably Germanic names these. It shows that men of this class, uh, medics, like the officers, brought their women folk with them to the frontier. So things have changed since the age of Augustus and Tiberius, where this was not normal. The reference to sorrow, a sister, again, is not literally a sister, but a common form of endearment, like frater for men. Um, let's go on to the next one. So the mention of women there leads us on perhaps to one of the most famous uh, letters from Vindelanda, actually written by a woman. This is a birthday invitation. Perhaps we could have the English as well. Um, from one Claudia Severa to the wife of the commander Cerealis at Vindelanda, whose name is Sulpicula Tidina. The letter is remarkable for the light it sheds on family social life in the wilds of the northern frontier. Cerealis was probably himself a second generation Roman citizen, a Batavian nobleman commanding men originally from his own tribe. He had his wife Sulpicia and her sons living with him in the fort and they were accompanied by their personal servants and slaves. The other lady, Claudia Severa, who writes the letter, lived with her husband, Aelius Brocchus, who commanded a major stores unit near Carlisle. The families, as we can see, although they're perhaps second generation Romans, have been completely integrated into a, in a couple of generations into the well-to-do Roman social life. The journey to the birthday party would be arduous, probably require a military escort. And like Trautius in the previous letter, Lepidena had a capable professional scribe to write the body of the letter, but she had added her own personal greeting where it says, I shall expect you, sister. This is in her own handwriting again on, on the corner of the leaf at the bottom. As we said, Cerealis and Lepidina have their sons with them in the camp. And one remarkable piece of evidence concerning their education is a school exercise. This is the next one, written by one of them in capital letters on the back of an old discarded letter. It's an attempt 
as you can see, at writing out a line of Virgil, it's from Book 9 of the Aeneid, on the flight of winged fame through the city. And it's fine until the end. It should read per urbem, and you can see he's, the boy's put pubem. Um, probably because he was copying it from a document in which pear was just p with a, um, a little mark under the top. And in cursive script next to it, there's this saying, which we think might be a comment from the tutor, saying it was said and it's lazy. <laughs> He's gone wrong at the end of the line. He's not paying attention and doing it properly. The Aeneid was commonly used for writing exercises. But it's unusual to find a quotation like this from the end of the work, usually they're from Aeneid 1. And since the discovery of this tablet, we've found two more. Uh, one single line of Aeneid 1 is repeated in two hands on a single sheet, probably two children copying out the same line. It's interesting to surmise whether a copy of the whole of the Aeneid or other literary texts would have been in Serialis' possession at the fort. Certainly one of his fragmentary letters refers to his Libros, his collection of books that he kept in the camp. Other evidence for family life lower down the social scale and involving a present of clothing tells that this is the next um, handout tells us a bit more about the cold conditions that soldiers from further south would face on the frontier. This was one of the first letters to be found in 1973. It's a letter from a family member, possibly back in Germany, recording the dispatch of presents, as you can see, including socks, sandals, and underpants. And it says Absatua. We don't know whether that's a place or a person. This is the first literary reference. You'd be interested to know to socks. And the first reference to underpants in a military context. Although it's obvious to assume that both must have been very necessary in the cold conditions on the northern frontier. And since we found this letter, in fact, we've discovered a textile sock that's been preserved in the same anaerobic conditions as these documents and a wooden a woolen insole for your boots to keep make your boots warmer uh, again all in the commander's house <clears throat> a number of documents throw light on food provisions for the fort large amounts of wheat were needed to feed the fort inhabitants and barley was needed both to feed the livestock and to make Celtic beer, which seems to be the main drink on the fort. There are mention of ox herds, cow herds, and other supervisors of livestock, which imply that the land round the fort was managed to produce food for the soldiers. Uh, the next handout shows that hunting was also um, a popular pastime and would have filled up the meat content of the supplies. So here we've got Cerealis in a letter to Brocchus asking to be sent some hunting nets. These would have been used for netting wildfowl. And there are other documents with mentions of hunting dogs. Um, I think the next letter is from a slave on food purchases. And we start with items that could have been grown and bought locally. They don't seem to have been, uh, they don't seem to have been grown on the farm for the army. They're being bought in a local market because he mentions if you can get them at a fair price. And some of the items are imported. So we've got wine, we've got fish sauce, olives uh, being bought in by a middleman for use uh, in the fort. 
Now I'd like to finish with, and I can't because this is my uh, subject rather than the history and the content, just a little word about the Latin of these texts. Generally speaking, the Latin is of the same reasonably high standard that could be found in military records at the time all over the empire from Britain, Israel or Egypt. So if we didn't know these were found in Britain, then there's really no local elements in the Latin to give that away. Tacitus mentions Agricola setting up schools in Britain and their ability in Latin. But the documents we're dealing with here were written for the most part, as we've said, by second generation Romans originating in the Rhine Valley. They're quite revealing as far as pronunciation is concerned. Uh, Id quod is written it quot, which uh, represents the pronunciation of the time. One oddity we've got here, that those of you who are good at Latin can spot straight away, is it's on an official report um, of all the present and correct, basically. All are where they should be. Ad locker qui debunt instead of debent. And this is not just a once-off. This is on all the military reports they use this form. There's no um, um, reflexes of this form in romance. It's devoir. It comes from a second conjugation verb. So this is just a one-off that we find uh, on these little uh, documents. As might be expected, letters from slaves like example 14, sometimes contain more substandard Latin than those dictated by officers. So uh, if we go on to the next handout, the Florus letters, um, there are two letters on one sheet here because it's going to the same place. One chap reads his letters and then he passes it on to the next man to say uh, space. Um, You can see some interesting colloquial features here. The loss of final M on clusam, clusa for clausam. Final S in habea for habeas. Frate is his odd for frate, probably influenced by the S in the following securum. And throughout we've got confusion of short I and E. Darbes for darbis, signarbet for signarbit. Beneficiario for beneficiario. All these reflecting the pronunciation of Latin at this time. Notice also the use of in plus ablative for in plus accusative in the phrase in carulo, in, into the cart. The second of these letters incidentally contains the word tilia, line tablets, generic name for tablets, whether they were made of lime or not, as we said they were not in Britain. The surprising thing is that non-specialized slaves all seem to have been able to write reasonably good Latin. So I just want to make a few remarks in conclusion. Um, the, Relieve, they reveal quite a lot that we didn't know before about um, the army on the frontier. The most important thing that we can see is that the fort was manned not by Roman legionaries, but by auxiliary troops from newly Romanized provinces in the Rhine Valley. Copies of letters sent from the fort to other Roman sites suggest that the Romans themselves were concentrated not on the frontier, but in the already pacified and civilized centers in the south of the province, such as Chester and London. On the strength report, we saw how flexible numbers of a unit could be and how huge numbers could be detached to uh, duties elsewhere. Activity reports show the troops were not mainly concerned with military maneuvers and fighting. Also, there are not many mentioned as wounded. They were involved in peaceful activities, building, provisioning, and so on. 
purchase account show the stores and stores lists shows that the traditional rations of pork, wheat and, wheat and olives that we're told about in such military writers as Vegetius um, don't reflect the full variety of food available even to common soldiers uh, on, the, on the war. Literacy was more widespread than previously suspected. Even lowly slaves wrote to one another and officers dictated their letters to clerks that only signed the end uh, and perhaps added personal greeting, as we've said in worse Latin and worse writing. Finally, the army itself appears to be self-sufficient and has less little contact with the natives apart from buying food possibly in the local markets except on what in one report on their fighting methods the Brit the Britons referred to as we saw contemptuously as Britunculi are scarcely referred to uh, and local individuals um, are never named so I've just scratched the surface of what's available here and you've seen the bibliography if you want to investigate some of the thousands <laughs> of these that are available you can see it on the Vindolanda website there you've got the Latin text you've got a photograph of the sheet uh, and you've got some comments on the content and the language thank you very much Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation about uh, one of the most important documents regarding uh, Roman military life, I guess, besides literary sources and maybe uh, a few inscriptions. So now we're welcoming questions from our remote attendants and from the audience here. Stelinica, Stelinica. Μπορώ να βοηθήσω σε αυτό. Θα έχουν ερωτήσεις, ναι. Thank you for the lecture, Professor. Um, basically, I've got some comments and some questions regarding the military um, reports and the lectures. Um, despite the fact we've got uh, legionnaires, military people from the of Germanic origin, I have noticed that their comments are reflecting Caesar who wrote about 100 years ago yes. from the time they, they were present at Vindolanda. Um, my question is the following, how come these letters and reports reflect something so old yet on the other hand you have a very difficult area to control and we know for a fact that Britain was, well let's say, rather troublesome yes. in comparison to Gaul, etc. Mm. Um, do we have any more um, literary evidence from the letters themselves offering further insight? Yes, when you say that they go back hundreds of years, you mean in the style or in the content? Or um, the content, the, the, the content, the fighting yes. Of the Britons, because yes. Caesar starts off saying that the Gauls uh, don't know how to fight, yes. and by the time he wrote his seventh uh, book of his mm. commentaries, he was saying they're really clever, they're cunning, mm. they're devising methods, and they have strategy. Whereas at the beginning they had nothing and we're talking about a campaign of about seven years. Yes. Well, um, either it means that they didn't develop <laughs> very much uh, or, I mean, we, we really don't know where this report has come from. Um, quite commonly reports go back to literary sources. So if mm -hmm. they hadn't been out and seen what these chaps did themselves, mm -hmm. they wouldn't know whether they fought from uh, horseback or not. And the interesting thing, although it was a very troublesome colony, what this, what this particular group of documents is showing is that there's no great military activity going on at this period, for a period of 20 years, 
between a hundred and a hundred and twenty. Mm -hmm. They're consolidating their position. The wall, although it's, it's built, I mean, physically to keep out, you know, barbarian tribes, um, seems to be policed as a way, may have, way of checking on who's coming and going and allowing people to cross the border rather than as a defensive barrier. But this is only what we get from this short period. But I agree, the report on the Britons, we don't know why it was written and we don't know what, what the sources were. So it, it's quite possible, as you say, that there could be a literary source behind it that's yeah. uh, out of date by then. Um, I have another question. Um, you've mentioned in your lecture that there seems to be a limited interaction between the local people yeah. and the people inside the fort, as in the military personnel themselves. Mm. Um, do we have any archaeological evidence showing that there was something different going on? Because mm. Well, there are certainly it seems dwellings. rather odd yes. to be alienated yeah. from each other. I mean, obviously we've seen in a couple of these that they've used the locals as a source of supplies in markets, mm -hmm. as a source of vehicles, mm -hmm. you know. Um, they certainly don't seem to have been used in a military context, mm -hmm. and I think that will be in keeping with the policy of, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to be in an auxiliary unit, you're not going to serve uh, at home. I mean, some of it might simply be um, a result of the chance of what documents have mm -hmm. come through. The letter of recommendation to Brigonius could be a local trying to get into. Mm -hmm. And also, on the leave applications, it's clear that the soldiers have families, and we don't know whether these were British or sure. from their original. So there were connections between mm -hmm. the sites that grew up behind the wall. And in fact, the, the evidence is that these weren't there before the Romans came. These were built up mm -hmm. probably by the natives to supply the army um, after it had established itself there. Mm -hmm. So um, we do have a, a limited amount of um, documentation on supplies. Um, we don't know where these chaps were going on leave to, so that might suggest mm -hmm. connections. But certainly in a military context, they were not used and they don't seem to know much about what their capabilities were. Um, one final question. Um, are there any mentions of uh, any local chieftains? No. No, nothing. This, this one it is strange. letter is the one letter, and this is very strange. Mm -hmm. I would actually expect no to have names. names. No, yeah. And I think that reflects the fact that there are no particular campaigns against individual leaders mm -hmm. going on in this period. Mm -hmm. Also, it may be a result of the fact that the selection of documents is odd because it's just the ones that the governor kept copies of okay. in, in his own um, praetorium rather than the official records. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is uh, a quite relevant question from a colleague. Um, is there evidence in the tablets from uh, Eleni Fassa? Is there any evidence in the tablets for uh, contacts between the members of the Vitalanda community and other parts of the Roman world? Are there references to contemporary events? Um, there are no references to contemporary events, but there's certainly quite a lot of evidence for travel. Um, we, we saw from that strength report that we've got members of this particular cohort going to Gaul for some unspecified reason. Um, so most of the documents referring to travel are within the empire. There's this one reference to people being in Gaul and there are 46 where we can't read the destination they've gone to. So. Certainly there were close links, and this letter with the socks and the pants came from Germany, we think. So there's a clear indication that they were well integrated into the system, the administrative system in Northern Europe generally. Thank you.
Um, there's a further comment. Um, and the com you know, concerning one of the first slides, which referred, among others, to eye diseases. Mm -hmm. There are also many references specifically to eye diseases in Egyptian papyri. Yes. Um, uh, this just does seem to have been very common in the army. Um, because of bad nutrition. And the, and the, uh, the condition, the army conditions are pretty similar all over the empire. Uh, but it's not just in the army because you get many cases of this type of eye disease in cities as well. So I think it's to do with malnutrition, but also perhaps more in the army more frequently um, the hygienic conditions if they're on although we don't seem to we don't seem to think these chaps are out there fighting so it is rather unusual but you know if they're doing strenuous activities away from the court the bath areas and so on um, it's just something that's very common like like rickets and other diseases which are to do with Vitamin deficiency. They're not related to the climate no. or it's no, it's a, no, because they're all yeah. all throughout the empire and yeah, in Rome. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the diet doesn't seem to be bad either, really. So it, it's a bit of a puzzle. Mm -hmm. But these are the co the causes are vitamin deficiencies and lack of hygiene. That's what mm -hmm. we can say. Okay. Are there, are there any uh, questions? Uh, thank you very much for this account, which I find very fascinating. Um, I'm an archaeologist, yeah. and I understand that you're not, but no. hey, yes. Perhaps you would like to elaborate on my question. If we could go back to the photograph of uh, um, one of the tablets that you showed. Yes. Um, that was about the second uh, photograph, I think. On the Oh, it's the third. <laughs> it's right near the beginning, anyway. It's after the back. That's it. Yes. Um, I found the, the shape is rather interesting. Why is it not completely uh, square? Well, well some, as you can see, there's a, there's a bit of a drop that's hitting on the top corner there. So that suggests that we just lost that portion Oh, so it's just this one, which is yeah. not so going to... Oh, okay. It's, it's, it's lost to it was it's, it's Okay. Mm. Um, also, do, do you have some sort of evidence, direct or indirect, in these tablets about who was manufacturing these at this military context because it sounds like there would a big number of these would be yes. uh, so yes, that was put in the military government, so it was normal. Right. And the last question, um, how big is this place which would be able to host uh, like 700 uh, soldiers? Um, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is <laughs> not. The whole site with a wall around uh, oh, okay. and, uh, but of course, there are lots of the soldiers are very close to getting them. Don't need a lot of them. But that certainly is a big sign. And we saw on the map, it was the central focus of the year. And it strictly suggests that the cohort then is being increased in size by the recruits as probable as for that period of the war, and that's a huge not with the force of the house 
There's another question from uh, Nicoletta Canavu. Thank you for this very informative presentation. I was wondering if you could tell us a little, a little about similar collections of writing tablets, especially the Vindonesia tablets, perhaps also about possible links between Vindolanda and Vindonesia. Um, well, I think there are, the, the problem is not that these tablets don't... Oh, sorry, I'm you please thank you. I think the evidence I've shown and the literary evidence and so on, and the fact that these letters come from other places shows that they were used um, even in Italy, because we've got them on the um, legal codes, they must have been used at all the military forts in, in northern Europe, in most areas where papyrus was not available. And I think it's simply the physical conditions at Vindelanda that means that they've been preserved there. And I don't know about this other site, so I don't want to, I can't comment on that. But I'm not surprised there are other areas where they are found if the conditions are correct to preserve them. Okay. Is there any is there the last question from the audience? No? Is something? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay then. So to say a big thank you for this very interesting uh, paper. Και να σας θυμίσω ότι α, αυτή είναι η τελευταία διάλεξη για το κλασικό σεμινάριο. Ωστόσο, το πρόγραμμα διοργανώνει α, δύο ακόμα διαλέξεις, 6 και 7 Μαΐου, οι οποίες α, θα λάβουν χώρα στα, στο κτίριο του Πανεπιστημίου α, και αφορούν, α, μάλλον α, επισκέδονται το Πανεπιστήμιο ο κ. Ρίζος, Ευθύμης Ρίζος, ο οποίο βρισκόταν στο ΚΟΤΣ, και το θέμα του είναι η ίστηρη αρχαιότητα, ο ρόλος της Κύπρου στην, στην οικονομία του, του πρώην Βυζαντινού κράτους και νέες πόλεις στην ίστηρη αρχαιότητα, 6 και 7 Μαΐου, Τρίτη και Τετάρτη. Σας περιμένουμε εκεί. Υπάρχει όπως πάντα μια μικρή δεξίωση έξω με κυπριακό κρασί. Ευχαριστούμε για άλλη μια φορά τους χορηγούς μας και τη Χρυσάντη Δημητρίου για τη βοήθειά της όλη αυτή τη χρονιά. Και